This is Stay the Water, and I'm your host, award-winning Dr. Eric Clavel, and we'll be back in just a moment to discuss these and other important issues that you, the community, care about. All right, welcome back to Stay the Water. I'm your host, award-winning Dr. Eric Laville, and we thank you so much for joining us on this Sunday afternoon. Well, as always, we've got a lot to talk about. You know, Joe Biden now is president of the United States. The inauguration is over. And what a wonderful inauguration it was, especially with Amanda Gordon. We provided, you know, um, uh, we provided analysis during the inauguration live here in the studio, you know, with our millennials, with myself, with uh, our radio personalities. And again, we saw that peaceful transfer of power, which is something that we cannot take for granted. But we've got now on the horizon an impeachment trial coming up for now former President Donald J. Trump. And we're, we're going to delve into the executive orders in the first 100 days here of President Joe Biden and what he's laying out for America. But before we do so, we've got a special guest who's not a stranger to Norfolk State University, not a stranger to WNSB and State of the Water. we got Mr. Joe Brooks, who is the Director for Equity and Advancement for the United Way of South Hampton Rose here to tell us about an event that they have coming up. Mr. Brooks, so glad to have you today. Happy New Year. And Happy New Year to you and your listening audience, uh, Dr. Claville. It is a joy once again to be on your show. Again, you know, when I say that you're a friend to Study of the Water and also WNSB and NSU, uh, we were just talking earlier, you know, and, and you've been in this position of, of director for equity and advancement uh, for a short time, but you've done so much. And everything that you've done, just about, you've included Norfolk State University in those efforts. Well, absolutely. Uh, Norfolk State University is an anchor tenant uh, in the community, so uh, they absolutely have to be leveraged to be able for us to deliver our message to the community. You know, true partnerships, that's the only way that we can grow together, we can move forward together, and we can build together. And United Way of Southampton Rose and the work that you're doing there and we're collaborating with you is a great example of that. And we've got an example of collaboration coming up uh, with the program that you have. Tell us a little bit about what you have coming up uh, on this week. Yeah, um, so our African American Leadership Society, which I lead for the United Way, has created a panel series on building equity in the black community. Our first event was on November 16th, which we promoted on your show, which was a faith-based perspective on equity, included leaders from the uh, faith-based community here in Hampton Roads. Our next event is this Thursday, uh, January 28th, from 12 noon to 1.30, and it is entitled uh, Building Equity in the Black Community. The election is over, now what? And as you uh, just stated in your message before, we have a new administration running the co- uh, the country. Right, right. So how can they <laughs> broadly advance uh, social equity for people of color in the United States? So we're going to have panelists from the higher education community, from local city government, and also an award-winning journalist. We've got uh, Norfolk State's own Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander, who will be a panelist, along with Dr. Patrick Graham, who is an advisor for the city of Richmond. We have uh, Steve Crump, who's an award winning journalist. And uh, we also have Aaliyah Slappy Wilson, who is the uh, chief of diversity and inclusion for the city of Norfolk. And then the panel will be moderated by April Woodard, who is a professor at Hampton, and her father was the former president of Norfolk State. That's right. So we're going to have a healthy dialogue regarding equity and topics, including why is it important to talk to your kids about equity and how they need to carry the torch, 
how you as a citizen can get involved, you know, in your own community in terms of improving equity. So we'll have a historical context on it. On it. So uh, if people would like to register, um, we would love to have the community uh, uh, attend. Of course, it's, uh, they can go to United Ways hr.org backslash equity once again that's united ways hr.org backslash equity to be able to register for the event you know joe this is phenomenal and when you're talking about the partnerships with nsu you mentioned our dean for our college of liberal arts here dr cassandra newby alexander who is an historian of of historians uh, that is well positioned to talk about these issues, but also you've got a, a, a list of phenomenal panelists and expertise to talk in from from news and reporting all the way to government. Right. So you have a, a list of people that can really drive home a different viewpoint and how especially African-Americans should be able to take a look at what's going on in our country. Right. Absolutely. Uh, when you look at the current climate of our country, uh, we were a divided nation uh, before the last administration. We're even more divided now. We certainly need a healing. We need a path forward. And we need events, you know, like this that are going to mobilize the community, and not just the African-American community, but the, you know, members of the community, regardless of race or gender, to come together to have a good conversation around equity and how everybody can do their part to build equity. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and and you talk about not just building equity, but building social equity. And that's that's extremely important because social equity actually intersects every aspect of our lives, whether it's education, whether it's economic, whether it's civil rights, you know, it's social equity. And if we don't invest in social equity, then everything else pretty much fails. You know, Absolutely. You know, now tell us a little bit about the work that the African American Leadership Society is doing that you actually lead at United Way of Southampton Rose. Yeah, we're a membership organization comprised of over 500 individuals that are passionate about uplifting under resourced communities. We recently had a food drive, which we partnered with Mission United. That's the United Way's arm for helping veterans. We were able to feed over 400 families during the holidays. You know, that's certainly, you know, one example. Um, We also uh, provide help at the Eastern Virginia Food Bank. And we're also creating initiatives like our panel discussions to have very open, honest, and transparent conversations regarding social equity, regarding the negative impacts of racism, but more importantly, how can we bring all different communities together, you know, to help, you know, build a path forward. So we also work with our private sector partners like Sentara Hospital, Uh Geico, and Town Bank to be able to recruit members, you know, um, but also not only recruit them for their contributions, you know, that go to the African American Leadership Society and the United Way, but also looking for their active voice their volunteerism to be able to help communities in need. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's just a few things that you do. So, again, to be a part of what the United Way of Southampton Rose African American Leadership Council is doing, you say it's a membership organization. Um, Who's able to join? Uh, Anybody can join. So you don't have to be a person of color, you know, to join. Anybody can join you know, the organization, we, we certainly need, you know, our allies uh, to be able to build effective coalitions, you know, for our mission moving forward. So we certainly invite anyone to be able to join us. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if they want to join, where, where can they find uh, the application? Where can they find more information about the African-American Leadership Council? Okay, they can go to that same uh, website that I provided, unitedwayshr.org backslash equity, and that'll provide not only information to register for the event, but they can also find uh, information to join the African American Leadership Society. But there's also a direct um, 
website for that, which is unitedwayshr.org backslash AALS. That's unitedwayshr.org backslash AALS. But we would love to have, you know, students, you know, faculty join us for this conversation on Thursday, the 28th, uh, beginning at 12 noon, and uh, not to only be able to listen, but to ask questions and really, you know, identify ways that they can get involved in their own community as we start a new year in 2021. Yes. And let this be a year of active participation and strategic activism to be able to transform, you know, your community here in the new year. You know, I think that's extremely important that you mention action. You know, we just celebrated the birth and the life and the works of one of our selfless heroes in America and really in the world, uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And that's been designated as a day of action to get out, to put your hands to, to help your fellow man and society uh, in order to improve your community and the world. And what what you just described and you've actually encouraged everyone to do on this Thursday is just that. So carry on that legacy of action, carry on that legacy of uplifting your community, carry on that legacy of ensuring that equity across our communities uh, continues to be a dream realized. So if you guys want to join, again, join at United Ways, that's with an S, hr.org backslash equity. That's United Ways with an S, hr.org backslash equity. And you can register for that on the website. It is free to register. Uh, It doesn't cost you a dime, but what you will get out of it will be just monumental. And really, you can't put a dollar amount on what you're going to get out of this. Again, um, this is the election is over now. What this Thursday January 28th at 12 noon. You can do it during your lunch break. And uh, we have April Woodard, who is the daughter of the former president, uh, uh, President Wilson, here at Norfolk State University. And our very own Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander, who is the current dean of our College of Liberal Arts. And uh, and just a, 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 a panel of guests that Mr. Brooks and the United Way have assembled to really, really make an impact here and give us something to think about. So in, in, in closing remarks, um, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Brooks. Is there anything else you'd like to say to our, our listeners? Well, listen, this is our kickoff. Our event this Thursday is our kickoff to Black History Month that begins in February. But listen, don't let Black History Month begin it in just in one month. We need to continue to have that spirit of strategic activism and getting involved you know, volunteering, you know, throughout the year, every single month. So I welcome, you know, um, your audience to join us on Thursday, but more importantly, to get involved. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Claville. Absolutely. Absolutely. We look forward to joining you. That's Mr. Joe Brooks, the Director of Equity Advancement for the United Way of Southampton Roads. We'll see you on Thursday. Okay. Enjoy. Thank you. All right. God bless. Again, Being able, and he mentioned something Joe Brooks mentioned, just not allowing one day or one month to define, you know, what we are trying to do as as it relates to pushing the envelope forward, right, as it relates to equity. So this is their kickoff to Black History Month, and we've got uh, a ton of Black History Month programs here at Norfolk State University, also here at WNSB, and you know, the Black History Month program is a signature program here at the university, and and the community has always supported, and we look forward to that even this year. You know, we're coming out of the pandemic, right? So we're coming out of the pandemic. We're still going to be adhering to uh, the CDC and health requirements to ensure that we're all healthy, we're all safe, so we can enjoy even more of these Black History Month programs and opportunities in order to learn a little bit more about our rich history in this country, right? Because this is our country. This is our country. We built it with our blood, sweat, tears, our labor, and we are building a new society here where everyone is recognized for their abilities and not demonized, you know, for what someone thinks that we should or should not be. 
So I'm going to get right into it because right now we are starting the first full week of a new dawn, a new administration in Washington, D.C. We're starting the administration of President, President Biden and Vice President Harris. And I like how they say the Biden-Harris administration. It shows that there's going to be, of course, we know Joe Biden is the president, but a sheer governance, you know, a sheer governance where all information, all facts, all data are taken in before making a decision. Now, that is in direct contrast of what we had four years ago. Four years ago, we had a president that was shooting from the hip. We had a president that only, only created policies for his own base. And when everyone didn't agree with it or someone didn't agree, he made his base go after them and he made them pay on Twitter and things of that nature. Causing a mockery of our democracy. But it's a new day. It's a new dawn. And we're going to talk about those actions and what should happen to our former president because of those actions, both in the second half hour. But I want to touch on now the Biden administration agenda for America, moving America forward in the first hundred days. And I, I, want, I want to hear from you, the callers, because this show is about understanding what you believe our country should be doing, our state should be doing, our city should be doing. And next week, we're going to talk about the agenda in the General Assembly uh, here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, because we are in the 2021 uh, session of the General Assembly for the Commonwealth. And we're going to talk about what what has been the agenda there, especially the African-American agenda uh, here in the Commonwealth, as we now get into all right, a new slate of candidates to be governor. But that's going to be next week. But I want to talk about the first 100 days, and I want you to call in in the second half hour. Let me give you the number now, 757-823-9110. 757-823-9110. And I want you to call in again in the second half hour at 1.30, and I want to hear what you have to say. But let me lay out what has been signed so far, what's been talked about. Before we can do anything, we know that our country is fledgling Economically, we know that people have lost jobs. People have been furloughed. The pandemic has just wrecked havoc. Something that we knew was coming in December of 2019. Something we knew was here in January of 2020. Something we knew that was running rampant in February of 2020. And something that the White House said that we're going to deny and say, hey, even if it is, it's going to go away in a matter of time in March of 2020. We were lied to. Those that knew did not tell us. Those that had the power to help hopefully save thousands and thousands of lives didn't do anything. But now we know. But the very first thing that the Biden administration has to do and that they have signed an executive order in in order to help these efforts is to get the pandemic under control. We got to do it. Everything hinges on this once in a century, once in a hundred year pandemic. The last pandemic we had such as this that we didn't really get a hold on and really didn't know how to tackle it was the Spanish flu of 1918 to 1920. It took two years, two years. For the world to get a grip on that that pandemic. And we had a super spready event called the World War, World War I we were getting out of that helped to spread a lot of that. But now we have, we're so interconnected in society, right? So we're so interconnected that we, people fly, tens of thousands of people fly across the world every single day, breathing the same air in that capsule of airplanes, traveling on ships, cruise ships, that is easy to spread, right? As a matter of fact, we, 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 we can't forget about the people that were trapped on cruise ships, you know, because they couldn't get off. They couldn't, they couldn't get off at the port because of the pandemic. They didn't want people spreading that pandemic. That pandemic, the COVID-19 has taken out so many people in a short period of time. And the people that it hasn't taken out, 
they are suffering now from long lasting, what they call long haulers, right? So we're still learning about this disease. We're still learning about this virus. But we could have done a lot more if we had leadership in the White House that would have listened to science and data and experts, but we didn't. So what President Biden, he has an aggressive agenda that he wants 100 million vaccines in 100 days. 100 million vaccines in 100 days. Now, we've had a discussion on this particular show, and there were others that talked about the safety of the vaccines and whether we should get the vaccine or not. And as African-Americans, we know, right, that the medical community has not been as honest to us in the past. You know, what comes to mind is the Tuskegee experiment. Uh, what also comes to mind is the forced ster- sterilization project in the Mississippi Delta that Fannie Lou Hamer was a part of, and many, many others, and the lack of, uh, of, of pharmacies and drugs and health care in our communities, even to this day, and the pandemic has shown that. So we understand the distrust. But we have people who are now trying to jump the lines to get this vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderma vaccine, and there's another vaccine, I think, by BioNTech. But we know that we trust the science, and we know that science isn't perfect. But for those who want to get the vaccine, want to get the what is going to end up becoming like a flu shot years down the road, uh, 100 million vaccines, shots in the arms of people that want it. In addition to that, now, r- let me go back to that. They also found that in getting those, in rolling out the vaccines, former President Trump touted a plan that we have everything was so successful in Operation Warp Speed and the rolling out of this vaccine, but they found there was no plan. They just got the vaccines and gave it to the states and said, hey, you do it. And every state is now trying to find out who do they give the vaccines to. Do they give it to people in nursing homes? Do they give it to first responders? Do they give it to children? Who do we give it to? First, what is that line? And do we give one dose or do we give two doses? There was no guidance from the federal government on that. Again, another failure, epic failure of many as it relates to policy and the health of the country as a whole of the past administration. So President Biden is trying to remedy that. Not only 100 vaccines, uh, 100 shots in arms, 100 million Americans that want it and a rollout plan, but also a national mask mandate in theory. So basically, if you are a federal employee, if you work in a federal building, if you're a federal contractor, anything that the federal government controls and you're employed by when you enter into buildings, you have to wear a mask. Because a national mask mandate in itself will probably be defeated in court. Because as one of the last studies that I just read, it shows that you have a large percentage of of white Americans that refuse to wear the mask because it infringes upon their rights of individualism and freedom. It's just a mask. It's just a mask. Okay? That's all it is. You have the freedom to do a lot of things. Just wear a mask. But he's given a challenge, a mass challenge, okay, to Americans and to cities and municipalities to say, hey, create a mass challenge in your own state. Create a mass challenge amongst your own in the city, municipalities. Create a 100-day mass challenge in your social groups, in your churches, in your, in your sports leagues. Just wear a mask. Because we have found that wearing a mask helps to curb. COVID-19, especially in African-American communities where our communities are knit tight in both in our in our culture, our life experiences, but also in our living quarters. You know, a lot of times in African-American communities, we have multiple generations living in the home. You have the grandmother or grandfather where you have the, the child that's living there. And in the same house, you maybe have the grandchildren that are there. This is something that's not new to our culture. You know, so wearing a mask will help to keep down the spread of the virus, especially when you come in contact with people who are not in your family. 
The second thing that he's signing is an executive order on immigration and visas. In other words, he's creating a an opportunity for citizenship through the, what's called the DACA program. We remember talks about that. People that were brought to this country as children and they've grown up in this country. They've been educated in this country. Some have gotten college degrees. Some are actually working now. But they lack the citizenship, the paperwork. So there's an opportunity for them to become citizens. So he's turning that around. And also the ban on African countries and Muslim countries. And we know the words of the former president that talked about that bad mouth, uh, African countries, black nations, and the like. And let's not even forget that there was a there was a ban. Well, there was a, a procedure in to deport people who were here from Liberia back to Liberia. And the history of Liberia and African Americans and the Marcus Garvey movement and free blacks and Liberia being a nation created by America for free blacks to go for African Americans to go back to Africa and live is a deep connection, right? So there's a lot of not only is it a good human, a good policy for humanity, but it's also as, as African-American history, there's a lot there that's good for understanding the history and understanding those, that country. But also on climate change, he's re-entered the Paris Accord in order to help combat climate change. But there are two things that I also want to focus on as it relates to African-Americans. First is racial equality and also the economy. Racial equality and the economy and the economy and going also back in also government accountability. But let, let's take a look at this executive order on racial equality. Now, former President Biden was uh, creating a commission called the 1776 Commission. And with that, it, it distorted the role of slavery in the United States. It distorted the role of slavery in the United States. And not on, on top of that, President Trump, former President Trump, had an executive order that limited the ability of federal agencies, contracts, and other institutions to hold diversity and inclusion training. They said that they were, basically it was a guilt trip, trying to make white America feel guilty for African American history or the African-American experience. Well, one thing about history is it is what it is. And African-American experience was made terrible by policies and laws created by white Americans. We look no further than slavery, look no further than Jim Crow, look no further than the, 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 the crack laws <laughs> that were implemented and the private prisons that were used to lock up members of our community. You know, if you're guilty about that, it is what it is. But it helps us to understand the state of our country and the experience of African Americans here in our country. Not to feel guilty, but to create better policies in order to help African Americans and others in our communities have a hand up as opposed to a hand out and a hand continue to press down on the upward mobility of African Americans. In other words, you can't know how to help until you've learned how you've hurt. And then the fact that a commission to distort the role of slavery in America, you know, this is, this is trouble. So now you're creating an entire commission to distort history as opposed and eliminated classes to teach it. Again, very disturbing. But also, President Biden has put a hold on evictions through a moratorium. And in addition to that, he's extending student loan repayments. That is huge. That is huge. That is huge. But does it go far enough for African Americans? We want to hear from you coming up in our second half hour. In our second half hour, we're also going to talk about the incoming Senate trial as it relates to the conviction, well, possible conviction of former president Donald Trump. So we're going to see what happens. Do we have the courage enough to actually do it? Is there enough evidence there? And there is something else that's come out 
about his time period there. So we're going to discuss it, and we're going to find out in the second half hour. And I want to hear from you, 757-823-9110, 757-823-9110. We'll be back after this commercial break. Catch the full court excitement of MEAC basketball today at Echoes Hall. The NSU Spartan women take on North Carolina Central today at 2 p.m. And you can catch all the action live right here on Blazing Hot 91. Blazing Hot 91 is the home of NSU Spartan basketball. The NSU Spartan women versus North Carolina Central today at 2 p.m. right here on Blazing Hot 91. Behold the green and gold. Blazing Hot 91. Your Blazing Hot music spot. I'm DJ INC from the top rope. I'm Cheryl Wilkerson. Make sure you wake up with us. Monday through Friday. 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. With the Blazing Hot Morning Show. I'll tell you why every day's a holiday. I've got your entertainment and your news. And we've got the legendary DJ Heart Attack. With the Blazing Hot Morning Shower Mix. And live on the spot weather and traffic updates. So go ahead, start your day with us. Monday through Friday. 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. With the Blazing Hot Morning Show. Right here. On Blazing Hot 91. Blazing Hot 91 supports the Hampton Roads community. If you are a 501c3 charity or nonprofit organization and you're actively working on an initiative, we want to hear from you. Email your flyer with detailed information to wnsbradio at gmail.com. Please allow two to three weeks advance notice. Support is based on availability. Blazing Hot 91 supports the Hampton Roads community. Welcome back to Stay the Water. I'm your host, award-winning uh, Air Dr. Eric Claville, and you've joined us for the second half hour here on Stay the Water. As we're talking about the Biden administration and their agenda to move a miracle forward in the first 100 days, and also the second impeachment trial of now former President Donald J. Trump. To convict or not to convict, that is the question. So we want to hear from you, 757-823-9110, 757-823-9110. Do you think that the Biden administration has gone far enough in the first 100 days executive orders for African Americans and also for the country? Do you believe that Donald Trump should be convicted in the Senate for inciting an insurrection? 757 823 We want to hear from you. But I want to go back to the last executive order that I discussed in the first half hour as it relates to student loans. Now, with student loans, we know that we have 1.4, about to be $1.7 trillion in student loans uh, for students across the country. And we know that the pandemic not only impacted universities and students, but it also impacted the opportunity for individuals who were graduating to go out into the job market to get jobs because there were none. There were no jobs because the economy shut down. So now you have a lot of students who were in peril. Now, we have student loan forbearance that was given under the Trump administration through the Department of Education that helped a lot of students. And it's been extended under the Biden administration until October 1st of 2021. So if you have student loans... Right now is zero interest, and you don't have to make a payment until October of 2021. But if you make a payment, it will go directly to taking off uh, the burden that you have, and there will be no interest added on that balance for the next 10 months. So we have some reprieve there. But we're also looking at student loan forgiveness. Should the Biden administration forgive student loans? Some say 10,000. Some say 50. Some say all of it, because at the end of the day, Main Street, if Main Street isn't help, then America itself can't really move forward. I mean, we bail out the banks every single time. We bail out corporate America every single time. We give a a trillion dollar tax break to the the top 3% in the first year of the Trump administration. On the Bush administration, we also gave a tax cut to the top 3%. And those are permanent. Keep in mind, the tax cuts that everybody else got, they actually come back, they actually uh, sunset in five to seven years. So they're not permanent. So does that help? Should African-American students who rely upon student loans, more so, have more relief? Well, it's a start. Forbearance, 
and also student loan forgiveness. We'll see where those numbers are. But we, we're going to need both in order to jumpstart the economy. And also, again, with we have to get the pandemic under control. So does it go far enough? We want to hear from you, 757-823-9110. But I want to deal with this latest trial for the conviction and the impeachment of former President Donald J. Trump. Okay, so let's take a look at this. First of all, we have a former president that's been impeached twice. 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 And should have been really kicked out of office after the Mueller report. After everyone that was going to jail, which he did pardon quite a few of those guys that went to jail, uh, that lied on his behalf and with their connections to Russia. But that didn't happen. In the very, in the next uh In the first impeachment, he actually tried to bribe the leader of a country of Ukraine to create an investigation, a bogus investigation against his, who he thought was the candidate that could beat him, which did, Joe Biden, and against his son. And if he didn't, he was going to withhold $400 million in military aid. Unbelievable. But we have a caller. Caller, you're on State of the Water. Give us your name and where you're calling from. Ronisqua, and I'm from Portsmouth, Virginia. Thank you so much for joining us here on State of the Water. What's on your mind? Um, so in regards to the student loan situation, um, you asked was it enough, especially for the black community. Yes. Um, honestly, no, I don't think it's enough. I do think it's necessary for us to um, address the, the crisis, the student loan crisis that we do have in America because it is a crisis. Yes. I'm a student myself. Um, so I know firsthand, um, you know, what it, what it is to have these loans and not be able to pay them back. But, um, in terms of what Biden has done already, I think it is, it's a great start, but I don't think it's going to fix any problem because we still have the schools charging people. Like, so it doesn't make, I mean, it makes things better, but at the same time, it's, it's still going to happen because the schools are still, you know, overcharging. I think yeah. college is too too expensive yeah. in this country. Now, do you believe that student loans, uh, now you know there is a forbearance, so you don't have to pay. There's no interest being charged uh, until the 1st of October, which basically, uh, if you have student loans, and that's federal, we're not talking private, student loans, you haven't had to pay anything or been uh, charged any interest, I think, uh, uh, from March of 2020 of last year. Uh, so that gives you some reprieve. But I'll ask you this question. Do you think student loans should be forgiven across the board? Or do you think 10000 or 50000 is enough? I think um, it should be a most likely like a case-by-case situation. I think maybe it should be income-based, an income-based system. Um, I don't really know too much about, you know, finances and the economy, so uh-huh. I can't really delve into, you know, the, the specifics about what a program for student loan forgiveness looks like for me, but I think it starts at looking at how much is this person actually capable of paying back. Like, right. we can't pay back 50000 Dollars worth of a loan if we only make seven dollars an hour or like even fifteen dollars an hour yeah and then on top of that it's like you graduate you still can't find a job yeah. i feel like if i think it's mandatory for universities and um all colleges to make sure that that is a, a portion that's included especially if we are Thank you so much. Well, I tell you what, that's an important point, and that's why we love your perspective as a student and as a listener. I want to thank you for listening to Say the Water here at WNSB, Norfolk State University. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Well, the caller mentioned, you know, that, you know, there is an, there's a disconnect between the degree and the job and the lack of jobs and the ability to pay. So there are some ideas out there. There's an idea of having a tiered system where income-based, that so much is forgiven. There's also a tiered system where 
if you, I believe if you pay your student loans on time for 10 years, they, the rest should be forgiven. Uh, there may be some volunteerism there, a uh, thousand hours over those 10 years uh, to have them forgiven after you make those on time 10 years of payments. But also, there are two other things. One, I don't think there should be interest charged on loans to go to school because it helps society as a whole. Now, I understand fees and administrating the program, and I'm not against fees, but I'm against interest because who is that helping? It's not helping anyone but the banks and the servicers of those student loans. And the other aspect of it is this. You know, there was, there was a discussion during the Bush administration, the last Bush administration and then Obama administration, about pegging, making community college, two-year colleges, free. So whether you go to trade school or community college, you get an associate degree, and you can go straight to work after you get those degrees and those certifications, then that would be free job training, and immediately you start impacting the community. And the idea was to peg it to the Pell Grant, that cost, where community colleges and trade schools can actually peg their cost to giving that education, that training to kids in, 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 that are coming into or people who are retraining uh, to the Pell Grant because it's money that's given as a grant anyway. And then on top of that, if you want to go on to a four-year degree, you've already taken two years out of, and you don't have any costs in going into those last two years. And, and I'll say this lastly. I'm a proponent of your last year of high school, if you completed all of your requirements, going straight into a partnership of community college or trade school, where now when you graduate high school in 12th grade, you also graduate with a trade or you graduate one year and you only need one more year to get your associates in order to go into a profession. I think that's, that's a smart way to do it because everybody's not cut out for a four-year degree. Everybody's not cut out for a professional school. But some people are great with their hands. Some people are great you know, in service industry jobs. And that's their gift. And there's nothing wrong with that. So I think we should invest in that. And those are some ideas that I have. You know? But what are your ideas? 757-823-9110. And thank you, caller, for, the, for, for your call. It's a very important topic. But I want to get back to this impeachment. Should Trump be convicted for inciting a riot? In the first impeachment trial, like I said before, he was trying to bribe and threaten a leader of a country, Ukraine. And if you don't know much about Ukraine, it's a former bloc of the Soviet Union. And now the aid that we give them for military purposes helps to buffer, uh, buffet them against invasion of Russia overtaking them, and also it helps our Western European countries, okay, such as the Great Great Britain, France, Spain, uh, Portugal, Germany, help them to defend against the encroaching former Soviet Union, now Russia. But he said, if you don't do this investigation, hey, you're not going to get this money. And he tried to withhold it. It was a phone call. They had testimony. They had people that were there. And he also obstructed justice to tell anybody in the federal agents that was working for him in the White House, you better not cooperate. But lo and behold, he got off. But now he's being, he was impeached again, and there's a trial for him inciting a violent mob to overthrow the democracy of the United States of America by stopping the counting of electoral college votes. The party of law and order. The party of respect authority. The party of make America great again was incited. People, their base, their voters that travel from all over the country. Just like Unite the Right in Charlottesville, Virginia. Angry white males. Angry Trump voters, Trump supporters who were fed lies, according to Mitch McConnell, now minority leader of the Senate, by the president and others in high-ranking officials and offices. And now you have the supporters of the president who are saying, it's a moot point. He's out of office now. Don't worry about it. Capitol Police got killed. Don't worry about it. African-American officers being berated being called the N-word. Don't worry about it. 
people going inside the Capitol, sitting at members' offices, at their desks, desecrating the Capitol, the rotunda, the temple of democracy. Don't worry about it. Individuals stealing podiums, going on the House and Senate floor, going through papers. Young lady stole the laptop out of uh, Nancy Pelosi's office trying to sell it to Russia. What a way to make America great again. Don't worry about it. It's a moot point. Individuals who tried to come in and said, after Mike Pence told him, I can't overturn the election, I don't have the power to. He said, Mike Pence let us down. They came to the Capitol and said, hang Mike Pence. While his family was also there because he feared for his family. So he figured they'll be safer in the Capitol than at home or anywhere else. Don't worry about it. It's a moot point. He shouldn't be convicted. Where the world saw, almost saw democracy fall. Where the Capitol Police actually called six times, but were rebuffed six times by the Department of Defense asking for resources, asking for the National Guard to be released to help. But Mike Flynn's brother, Lieutenant General Flynn, was actually in on the meeting that said no. Don't send them. Mike Flynn, who was also convicted of lying to the U.S. Attorney's Office, the Mueller investigation with his connections to Russia. He said, don't worry about it. When Steny Hoyer called Maryland and the governor of Maryland saying, send the, National, the Maryland National Guard, DOD said, don't send them, stand down. Don't worry about it. It's a moot point. And now we know, as the investigation continues to roll, New York Times just reported on yesterday, and it should be a hit story coming out on Monday, that a congressman, actually a Pennsylvania congressman, former general, Brigadier General of a National Guard unit, actually introduced and helped introduce a lower-level U.S. DOJ, Department of Justice attorney, to Trump to help intimidate Georgia and overturn the Georgia election by ousting the acting attorney general, the acting U.S. attorney general at the time, which was which is Rosen. All this is coming out through this investigation. But you have members that say, don't worry about it. It's a moot point. <sighs> is it a moot point? Can we truly move forward? Can we truly have justice without accountability? Can we truly have reconciliation without a truth moment? Can we truly have bipartisanship if we don't identify why we were separated in the first place? What do you think? What do you think? Are we at a crossroads in our country? where 71 plus million people voted for former President Trump that still believe, as people are getting, still believe in his policy, as people are getting that 3 a.m. knock on their door by FBI agents because they were in the Capitol. They were there going against Capitol Police. They were there stealing. They were there in a place where they should not have been. People are getting arrested. People are getting indicted. And these are federal charges. Okay? These are federal charges. Are we at a crossroads? Do What type of accountability do we need? 757-823-9110. 757-823-9110. We want to hear from you. Does the Biden administration, does the foundation of executive orders in the first 100 days, does it help to move America forward? Is it enough? And more specifically, is it enough for black America? We had a call about student loans and the caller mentioned it was a student loan crisis. What are your thoughts? And what are your thoughts about the upcoming Senate trial? And it's going to start February 8th, by the way, February 8th. 
They said that the president needed some time to prepare. Hmm. What are your thoughts on this? And we're going to start to take calls on this in just a moment. So if you're if you're in queue, hold on. We're going to get you on air in just a moment. But I want to go back over this point that this rabbit hole of what happened goes a lot deeper. I just mentioned New York Times reported Pennsylvania lawmaker played a key role in Trump's plot to oust the acting attorney general in undermining how the president was willing to in un, in in being involved in how far the former president was willing to go to overturn the election. And Democratic lawmakers have begun calling for investigations in these efforts. Come on. I'm, I'm, I, I can't make this up. I can't make this up. And I believe that even as we get to more and more investigations here, we're going to see more people involved, more people that turn a blind eye, more people that are having regrets now. Regrets as opposed to not having courage in the very beginning. And listen, I'm not taking anything away from people who are in position uh, that could have spoken up but didn't. Because you don't know what you're going to do when you're in a moment, when you're in a moment of crisis or hard decisions. Because you got to count up the costs. you got to count up the costs. But when it comes to lives, when it comes to our country, when it comes to ensuring that justice prevails and not a criminal acts, we all have a duty. We all have a duty. But again, you really can't judge a person, a man or woman, until you walk a mile in their shoes. And then again, these are individuals and how far they'll go. When they're in the power of privilege, in a position of power, privilege, and can actually make change. So that's where one of the executive orders that now President Biden has created of government accountability and is where it's meant to restore and maintain trust in government. So he ordered all of his appointees in the executive branch to sign the executive pledge. All of them to sign the executive pledge. And this helps to bring accountability, helps to bring trust, because we got to bring trust back to our system. We got to bring trust back to what is America. We got to bring trust back to democracy. We got to bring it back because we are the beacon of light for the world. So, what are your thoughts? We have a caller. Caller, you're on air. This is State of Water. Give us your name and where you're calling from. My name is Samantha. I'm calling from Henrico, Virginia. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on State of the Water in Henrico, Virginia. What's on your mind? Well, Tupo, I wanted to talk about the student loan crisis. Yes. And then the last piece of impeachment. With the student loan crisis, I've seen it from all vantage points. Like, I actually have student loans, and my loans are under 44000 but 4000 of it is interest. So you weigh, okay, I'm paying the interest on top of the loan. Right. But at the same time, when they put the practices in place, whether it's student loan forgiveness or did you work in a high poverty, did you work for a nonprofit, it just seems like a lot of red tape. Yeah. And you always come to a dead end. So my take will be if you're going to forgive the student loans, just universally forgive the student loans, as opposed to is it income-based, is it your ability to pay, I've actually seen it from the standpoint where I worked at a university. And mathematically, if you pay twenty five to $30,000 a year per year, by the time the student graduates, they don't have the ability to pay because they won't land a job that's going to adequately compensate them enough to even make a dent in their student loans. Right. So it's just the system is not designed for you to win when you look at what you have to Hey, that what you have coming in, what you have going out. I just think that they just need to come up with something universal, make it feasible for everybody, and then just move forward. Caller, let me ask you this. Do you think we should have student loans should have interest attached to them or just fees? No, no, because you're paying interest on top of a loan. You could get buried in interest before you even make a dent in your loan. 
There you go. So, 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 so it becomes a dead cycle. Exactly. All right. So about the impeachment trial, you wanted to address that. We have a few moments left. What are your With thoughts? The impeachment trial, my take is no above all. So just like Pelosi said, just give him a get out, get out, get out of the car. You know, can you obstruct justice? Do it's not put people's lives. It was dangerous. It was a dog whistle at best. Yes. Well, again, caller, you you hit a lot of nails on the head, and a lot of people feel that way. And I uh, think again, thank you so much for li- listening to State of Water and supporting us in Hiranko, Virginia. Thank you. All right. God bless. Well, as I've as I've stated before, you know, here on State of the Water, this is an opportunity where we get you, the community, a chance to let us know. You know, what exactly you think about the policies and the laws that are impacting us in our community today. And it gives you an opportunity to also give solutions to these problems. And we're listening, the community's listening, and our policymakers are listening. And we want you to join us next week here on State of Water where we talk about the agenda and the black agenda here in the Commonwealth of Virginia as it relates to the the General Assembly session of 20. 21. And also, if you have any questions, continue to give us a call here at 757-823-9110. We want you to chime in and let us know what you think. And again, it's been enjoy it's been a joy working with you and being a part of State Water here at WNSB. And because at the end of the day, this is your radio station. At the end of the day, this is your radio show. Because we want you, the community, to be involved. So as we talk about not just national politics, we talk about uh, uh, state politics. We talk about local politics. We also want to talk about the community. So if you have a community initiative that you want us to talk about here on the show, we want you to also give us a call at 757-823-9110 and let us know so that we can get you on the air. So again... We thank you so much. Happy New Year to you. The inauguration is over. We've got a new administration, but the mission is still the same. This is Dr. Eric Laville, and we'll see you next week.